he tied a red bandana around the phones. They run the phones, so you're paying them to use the phones. And anybody who doesn't have their permission to use phones, they'll attack, they'll slash. That was sending a message. You come our way, this is the repercussions. We're gonna scar you for the rest of your life. And uh, that's just to send them a message. You don't wanna F with us. When they were caught, they were put into their own disciplinary holding pen. They actually nicknamed their disciplinary jail the Bing for a Bing Cherry. And they called each other Dog, D-A-W-G. OG Mac was known to release his dogs on his enemies that were using the phone banks. At the time, they weren't allowed to have tattoos, so what they would do is they would take a cigarette and burn three dots on their shoulder, and that's a dog paw. It became a new set within the secret society, inside the walls of Rikers Island. We saw the red exploding. It was the UBN, the United Blood Nation, winning against the Latin Kings. Then they got bigger and bigger. They find ingenious methods to communicate. When they're in the yard under the observation of prison guards, they form their own sign language so that you know, law enforcement will not understand what they're planning, if they're planning attacks on a rival gang member, planning attacks on prison guards. Violent crimes inside Reich's Island did increase. Slashes increased, stabbings increased. In 1994, after just 18 months of the United Blood Nation in Rikers, stabbings and slashings spiked to 1,100 in a single year. And the word about the UBN began spilling out onto the streets. It started to spread as a lot of people left Rikers Island and were released on the streets. He wanted numbers, of course, like anybody would, a dictator would. But his numbers got really big. They started to recruit other members. If you ask me as a young cop 15 years before that, that there would be Bloods and Chris in New York, I'd be like, you're crazy. That would never happen here. His drug gangs and crews, and then he started to consolidate them with territory, generals, ranks. It was a new Red Army, the United Blood Nation. OG Mac was calling the shots from inside a hole in Rikers. And then the original gangster got out. In 1993, Omar Porti was sent to Rikers Island as a two-time convicted felon. Six years later, he was released a new man. O.G. Mack, an original gangster and the supreme leader of the United Blood Nation. When O.G. Mack got out of Rikers Island, he very quickly began to expand even further and market UBN to make it attractive and make it feared at the same time. He was, in a lot of ways, an underworld politician. He returned home to his original blood set, the 1-8 tray on 183rd Street in the Bronx. Yeah, I'll be hearing, I'll be hearing about the notorious 1-8 trays, you know? OG Mack goes back to the Bronx and he proceeds to carry a camera on the streets. But it's all blood area around here. Because he wants to know who the true bloods are in terms of his United Blood Nation and who the fake bloods are. Well, who, who you be, homie? So he would interview people and ask them questions that only true bloods would know. And what blood set you belong to? 1A Trey, all day, baby. He would quiz them on the 31, the rule book he wrote for the United Blood Nation while in prison. And that's when a lot of the problems came because he would challenge people. Why are you bang, homie? And if they didn't respond correctly, he would say, that dude is fake blood. And he would send his OGs out and other gang members out and they would slash their face. 
And that was it. So this went on throughout the city of New York. He brought the laws of the Bloods in Rikers to the streets of the Bronx and beyond. That's blood like this. OG Mac created a empire, and he did it in a matter of years. This wasn't something that was a slow burn. This was something that he envisioned, and he created it in almost the blink of an eye. That goes to his ability as a underworld leader and to his ability to bring people together. Just as he did in Rikers, he began building an army of followers by offering a new family. One thing that OG Mac did when he was released from prison was he would order gang members to, to put in work against rival gangs. That was one of the gang initiations. You had to commit criminal acts. They didn't just target fake bloods. They went after civilians. They would rob innocent civilians at gunpoint. They would rob stores and, and parking lots, for instance, in the Bronx. And that was one way gang members would become initiated into the Bloods. The crime was just part of the induction. New members would also be victims of a beatdown. They would have gang members beat the inductees for 31 seconds. And they would punch him, they would kick him. They call it blood in and blood out. You have to spill blood to become a member of the gang. And the only way that you can leave it is by somebody spilling your blood, in other words, through death. When someone got blooded in, they would have to purchase a set of rules, the blood rules, the blood codes. The Book of UBN Rules was written by O.G. Mack. His disciples took it as the Bible. The gospel, according to O.G. Mack and the United Blood Nation, began to spread beyond the Bronx and into the five boroughs of New York. The end result is that there was a lot of bloods that were joining under 1-8 Trey around the Bronx and throughout the city. There were a lot of buck 50 scars showing up on victims and a lot of new tattoos getting inked on new members of the UBN. Five pointed stars for the five points of knowledge, body, unity, love, lust, and soul. This hierarchy was created with the word general for a reason, right? I have an army. You didn't call him counselor, you know? You call him general, you're a general. And then what he would do to really elevate these guys, he had, a, it was called green light status. Green light status gave generals the ability to blood in new members without asking permission from OG Mac. That gives these guys an enormous amount of power. It gives him more numbers. It makes you go out and find more bloods. It makes you control those bloods. But ultimately, you're under me. So it's like soldiers under a capo. There were female members. They were known as the Bloodettes. Some of the one eight trade blood X right here. They were the most violent singers group you've ever seen. I mean, they would do what the guys did. They would fight. They were led by OG Mac's girlfriend, Paulette McCartha. The Bloods knew her as Big Mama. Many of her bloodettes focused on credit card theft and identity fraud. But instead of getting beat up, you can get sexed in. So basically, you get gang raped, and now you're a bloodette. Believe it or not, some of these kids want to be part of something so bad, they do it. OG Mac ordered them to create new bloods for the family of the United Blood Nation. He literally told them to produce bloods, and he used to call them blood drops. Oh, what made you become blood? I can't blood because I keep my baby father's a blood and my son's a blood drop. If you have a baby and you're a blood, it's a blood drop, which the baby's now automatically a blood. You got any kids? I got a blood drop on the way. You pregnant right now? Yep. The kingpin and founder of the United Blood Nation began to monetize his creation. He was trying to make money. Hey, you want to blood in? Besides all the other things you had to do to become a blood, you had to purchase a t-shirt and a hat. 
that said 1A Trey. It was kind of amusing. At one point, he was rapping. He was trying to get in a rap world. He did a DVD with rap songs on it that was terrible. He was a very self-promoting type of guy. He was trying to make a life story and sell it to the media. But to them, he was just telling them, this is all about you, I'm taking care of you. Under his leadership, crime skyrocketed in the Bronx and began to creep up along the eastern seaboard. New sets of the UBN sprang up in Maryland, North Carolina, and Florida. Crimes from credit card fraud to murder were committed in the name of OG Mac. Within a couple of years, UBN was spreading all up and down the East Coast. It had started in one wing of the Rikers Island Correctional Facility, and by the new millennium, it was in seven or eight different states. It was just coordinated violence instead of random violence. And through coordinated violence, somebody profits. He profited. We were surveilling him and following him, and he would hit a corner, and they'd all come out of the woodworks, all the bloods. And they'd all be throwing their signs and signing. It was like their king came. We literally wanted to cut the head off. We had to get the top guy. In 1993, Omar Porti planted a seed in his cell at Rikers Island, based on a West Coast gangland philosophy. By the year 2000, his United Blood Nation had grown into a monster. Sets of bloods could be connected to increasingly violent crimes up and down the eastern seaboard. So the FBI became involved in the OG Mac case in the summer of 2000, when the decision was made to try to prosecute this federally under federal racketeering statutes. OG Mac was very good at organizing. He made them feel like they were part of something. But now when you do something like that, and law enforcement is looking at you, yeah, you're organized. Yeah, you're a good leader. Okay, so now I'm gonna attack you that way as a law enforcement officer. You're the guy. Your hierarchy is running this criminal enterprise. Therein lies the idea of going federal RICO case. RICO stands for the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It was originally designed for organized crime and they had tremendous success with it. And we had never really done a RICO on an organization like that for gangs, at least I had not. Prior to RICO, if an individual ordered a murder and had somebody else carry out that murder or another specific crime, it was very difficult to prove the crime against the individual, the intellectual author, if you will. However, with RICO, we were able to close that loophole and be able to get the primary leader in terms of acts committed by underlings. The big numbers of membership meant more opportunity for law enforcement to find informants and flip bloods caught committing crimes. There was, at one point, probably 30 different people we were looking at and each person you had to review that criminal history and go back and look at the previous crimes. You know, they were so busy, you had to pick which ones you're gonna follow that day. And we did hours upon hours upon hours of surveillance. While the federal government began putting the pieces of a RICO case together against the UBN, its leader went public to recast the image of his bloods. He came out with this thing, had a New York Times interview that they had a new Black Panthers, that they were gonna do good for the neighborhood. You know, my mother, it was all He was a narcissistic guy. The evidence was clear that he was more than that. He was a gangster. The investigation was revealing that he was a shot caller. You didn't do anything without his blessing. They ran the gamut with the crimes. The most common stuff was extortion from drug dealers, robberies at gunpoint, carjackings, 
drug sales. Everything from shootings to slashings, stabbings, assaults with blunt objects, and narcotic sales, now mainly crack. In the spring of 2001, under a sealed indictment, a grand jury charged O.G. Mack and 14 members of its UBN crew with 31 criminal acts in a massive federal racketeering case. The number of counts matched the number of rules O.G. Mack had written for the members of the United Blood Nation. The goal was to arrest all of our subjects at the same time, especially the main targets, because if you were to grab one and the word got out, they'd all start scattering. So there was a lot of different players involved. Hundreds of officers on the local and federal level played a role in the takedown. OG Mac is always surrounded by members of the United Blood Nation, and it's imperative to create a ruse that will prevent a shootout, massive bloodshed. We knew where everybody was. We knew where they slept at night. We knew where their girlfriends lived. We knew where their families were. We wanted Mac and his top OGs in custody before we grabbed everyone else. So we went into this targeting Mac's birthday. Over a nearly two year period, investigators had managed to get an informant on the inside. They sent his informant to basically lure OG Mac away from his stronghold. We had an informant invite him to a location, basically told him that there was girls there and they were going to celebrate his birthday. We're going to get a bunch of girls there, we, da, da, da. we had the guy just blow him up, tell him it's going to be a party, hot girls, but just bull****. OG Mac is a womanizer, and when he hears that there's a ton of women waiting for him, he basically dissolves his common sense and forgets about security and waltzes right in. Law enforcement has at least 200 individuals waiting to arrest them. Good evening. Tonight, the feds launched a crackdown of the notorious Bloods gang by hitting it at the top. Prosecutors indicted 15 members of the gang and its female counterparts, the Bloodettes. He was cool as ice. He was angry, but he did not want to talk to us. He's like, do what you got to do. And that was it. He was a career criminal, hard jail guy, you know, hardcore, and he wanted nothing to do with us. We attempted to talk to him, and he wanted no part of it, so we put him in a holding cage, and he was just screaming out blood stuff. And I just looked at him and go, he doesn't realize it's all over, and like, over and over. Awaiting trial, he was sent back to Rikers, this time in an isolated cell, cut off from the prison population he once lorded over. The indictments were handed down. The gang had been taken off the street, and everybody else had pled out. So we would work every day in the weekends in order to prepare witnesses, to include cooperating witnesses, former gang members that were testifying against Omar Porti or OG Mack. They were on a fast track to put away the founder of the United Blood Nation. And then 9-11 happened, so the entire office was involved in that investigation. Pretty much everything grinded to a halt. The government picked up the case against OG Mack in the spring of 2002. As we prepare for trial, people were flipping and giving information. And then as you build this investigation, you document everything, facts, evidence, testimony, electronic surveillance, photos, and then it's look at what we have. Over two months, a jury listened and examined the case against Omar Porti, the man behind the myth of OG Mac. I try not to like stare at him, but he was laughing, joking half the time. To me, it seemed like he didn't have a care in the world. Then he get really upset, constantly talking in his lawyer's ear. He's a control freak. The defense was trying to discredit that it was an organization. It was just a loosely knit 
group of people, that it wasn't what the government was making it out to be, but it was an avalanche of evidence against him. The trial lasted more than two months, facing weapons charges, racketeering, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine, Omar Porti was found guilty on all counts. I believe he said something on his way at the end after his guilty verdict, he yelled something out, blood up or something on the way into the cell. At his sentencing, he told the judge that she was like a doctor standing over him, that she could save his life. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. When he left the courtroom, he was shell-shocked. He never knew that the judge was going to give him that much time. This is a very violent person. He has no regard for human life, certainly doesn't care about innocent civilians. He was sent to Florence, Colorado, which is the supermax prison, where the most notorious criminals in the United States are sent. So he is in there with the worst of the worst. He was holed up in the middle of the country between the original gangsters, the West Coast Bloods, and the monster he created back home, the United Blood Nation. After Mac was incarcerated, you would hear somebody say they were blood, but I would never hear them talk about UBN. In fact, after the trial was over, I actually went back to the neighborhood of 183rd and Davidson, and we pretty much wallpapered the whole neighborhood with posters, these people and their pictures on them telling them, if you want to commit these kind of crimes, and you want to be involved in this kind of organization, we're going to come after you. And if we get you, you're going to end up in jail like OG Mac. Or you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison.